Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India This session is on the molecular mechanisms of what are called renal tubular acidosis. That is not a spelling mistake, it is the plural of that noun. The term renal tubular acidosis refers to conditions where there is a problem with bicarbonate reabsorption in the proximal tubule, what is referred to as proximal RTA or type 2 RTA or there are problems with bicarbonate generation in the distal tubule a condition called distal RTA. There are two types, type 1 and type 4. A reduction in bicarbonate output from the kidney will lead to a reduction in plasma bicarbonate and that state is called metabolic acidosis. We have seen some features of renal tubular acidosis already and we will revisit that now. In these conditions, there is a primary reduction in bicarbonate formation and there is compensatory hyperchloremia to balance all the cations that are there, chloride levels will increase. The anion gap is normal, so this is a hyperchloremic normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. We have also seen that in type 1 DRTA and type 2 which is proximal RTA, there is hypokalemia whereas in type 4 DRTA there is hyperkalemia just like the other causes of metabolic acidosis. PRTA and type 1 DRTA are different from all other types of metabolic acidosis in that they have a low potassium. We will see why. In fact why there is hypokalemia in proximal RTA we will reserve that question for later we would not consider that in this session. So all these other causes of metabolic acidosis are similar in that potassium is high and urine pH is acidic as in normal individuals. Whereas only in these two types potassium is low, not only that urine can be alkaline. So in these two conditions there is an acidosis. So while blood is acidic, urine is alkaline. Let us see why in all other cases of metabolic acidosis except PRTA and type 1 DRTA, there should be hyperkalemia. In all other types of metabolic acidosis except PRTA and DRTA, there is hyperkalemia and why may that occur? Whenever there is acidosis at the level of every cell, there is exchange of protons with potassium some protons will translocate into the cell so as to keep the plasma pH normal or extracellular fluid pH normal and the cells will buffer the extra protons. The cellular proteins can bind the extra protons just like hemoglobin buffers protons within red blood cells. So when protons translocate into the cell to maintain electroneutrality, some cation must move out and what better cation than the predominant cation within the cell which is potassium. And the transporters involved in these movements are different. So because potassium can come out of the cell in acidotic states, there can be hyperkalemia. There is also another reason why hyperkalemia may occur in all other types of metabolic acidosis. In those conditions, when protons build up in blood, the proton pumps would be working maximally to extrude the protons so as to generate enough bicarbonate to maintain pH in blood. We have already seen that protons and potassium compete for extrusion, compete for the luminal electronegativity for the extrusion. When protons are extruded in large quantities, there may be impairment of potassium extrusion, potassium may build up in blood 
and that is one of the cause of hyperkalemia in metabolic acidosis. However, these two types, type 1 and type 2 renal tubular acidosis are exceptions to the rule in that they have acidosis and hypokalemia and why may that be? We will consider the mechanism of hypokalemia in these two conditions as we go. Let us discuss the molecular mechanisms that may lead to proximal renal tubular acidosis. The proteins in the proximal tubular cell that are involved in bicarbonate reabsorption are carbonic anhydrase, the enzyme which is responsible for forming bicarbonate within the cell, the sodium bicarbonate co-transporter which extrudes the bicarbonate. We have already seen in the lecture on transporters on the membrane that the sodium bicarbonate co-transporter is a secondary active transporter and bicarbonate transport drives active transport of sodium. So this transporter is different from all other types of sodium dependent co-transporters and all the others like sodium phosphate, sodium amino acid transport etc. Sodium gradient drives the transport of the other substance whereas in this one bicarbonate gradient drives active extrusion of sodium. So that is the second protein that is important for bicarbonate output into plasma. A third one is the sodium hydrogen exchanger on the luminal border which extrudes the protons which are formed during the reaction and that is important because unless you remove the products of this reaction, the reaction cannot go on indefinitely. The protons that are extruded into the lumen bind to the bicarbonate that is filtered at the glomerulus with the help of a carbonic anhydrase enzyme which is on the luminal border of this proximal tubular cell and that catalyzes the reverse reaction wherein carbon dioxide will be formed and this bicarbonate will be removed from the tubular fluid. We can think of proximal renal tubular acidosis as a condition which arises due to a problem with any one of these three proteins. Let us take the case of carbonic anhydrase first. A good example is acetazolamide therapy. Acetazolamide is an inhibitor of carbonic anhydrase. It is used in therapeutics as a diuretic and sometimes as a respiratory stimulant. When acetazolamide inhibits the carbonic anhydrase enzyme, enough bicarbonate cannot be formed and that can lead to metabolic acidosis. Let us consider the features of this metabolic acidosis. Of course, bicarbonate is low. I am showing two reports here. What is called the arterial blood gas analysis report. This is indeed a lung function test to assess if the lungs are function normally so that the carbon dioxide and oxygen and arterial blood are within normal limits. A sample of blood is taken from a peripheral artery and the blood gases are analyzed. That is why it is called an arterial blood gas report. That report also gives bicarbonate and serum pH, arterial pH. So bicarbonate will be low. A serum electrolyte report is done in venous blood. That also gives bicarbonate. So bicarbonate will be low in this condition because bicarbonate reabsorption is reduced. Serum pH is naturally low. That is why it is an acidosis. And because bicarbonate is low, if the lungs are normal, they will try and compensate and minimize the decrease in serum pH due to the reduction in bicarbonate by decreasing carbon dioxide as well. There will be hyperventilation to blow off excess carbon dioxide. Therefore, carbon dioxide concentration in arterial blood will be lower than normal. That is a compensatory mechanism, what we called respiratory compensation in an earlier lecture. Let us look at the electrolytes. We have already seen that this is a hyperchloremic acidosis, anion gap will be normal. What about potassium? We have seen that in all other cases of metabolic acidosis, while there is hyperkalemia, in PRTA, serum potassium is actually lower. 
we will see why serum potassium has to be low in this condition in the next session on metabolic alkalosis because it appears to me that the mechanism of hypokalemia in PRTA is similar to what happens in metabolic alkalosis. Another important test is urine pH. We have seen that urine will be alkaline in only these two conditions, PRTA and type 1 DRTA. And why should urine be alkaline? Because this reaction is impeded. Not only is there inhibition of bicarbonate export to plasma, but less protons are extruded into the tubular fluid and therefore all the bicarbonate which was filtered is not converted to carbon dioxide. The bicarbonate escapes in urine and that is why there is bicarbonaturia and that is the cause of a relatively alkaline urine. Urine pH can be more than 5.5. The alkalinity of urine in this condition is less severe than what happens in type 1 DRTA. Nevertheless, urine pH is more than what we see in normal people. Acidosis is normally associated with hyperkalemia and alkalosis with hypokalemia. In PRTA, acidosis is associated with hypokalemia and the mechanism, it appears to me, is similar to what happens in alkalosis and therefore we will consider the mechanism of hypokalemia in PRTA when we consider metabolic alkalosis. A second state in which bicarbonate reabsorption in the proximal tubule may be affected is hyperparathyroidism. Parathyroid hormone can inhibit the sodium hydrogen exchanger in the luminal border which is responsible for extrusion of protons. Now why should parathormone inhibit the sodium hydrogen exchanger? A better known function of parathormone in the proximal tubule is inhibition of the sodium phosphate co-transporter thereby inducing phosphaturia. And why should it induce phosphaturia? Because the primary role of parathormone is to defend the levels of ionized calcium in blood. Ionized calcium is important to maintain neuromuscular excitability and when those levels decrease there can be enhanced neuromuscular excitability leading to skeletal muscle spasms. A condition called carpopedal spasm typically comes up when calcium levels in blood drop, ionized calcium levels, not total calcium. So parathormone has the job of defending ionized calcium and it does that by multiple mechanisms, by promoting absorption of calcium from the intestine through vitamin D, by promoting reabsorption of calcium in the distal tubule through vitamin D as well, then by bone resorption. It removes minerals from the bone, calcium phosphate and that is one source of calcium coming into blood with the aid of parathormone. When calcium phosphate is mobilized, the phosphate coming out must be extruded and that is why parathormone inhibits sodium phosphate co-transporters here producing phosphaturia. That is understandable. But why should parathormone inhibit the sodium hydrogen exchanger? Again, that is in the defense of ionized calcium in blood. Calcium in blood exists in two states, an ionized form in equilibrium with a form that is bound to albumin. It is the ionized calcium that is responsible for neuromuscular excitability. And alkalotic states can promote calcium to move into the bound state and that will lead to a reduction in ionized calcium and that is something that parathormone will not allow and therefore it inhibits formation of alkali in the proximal tubule. The features of proximal renal tubular acidosis due to hyperparathyroidism are very similar to what happens in acetazolamide therapy. Why the hypokalemia? We'll reserve the question for later. A third cause, that's the only transporter left now, a popularly known cause of proximal renal tubular acidosis is what is referred to as Fanconi syndrome. Now, this is not a pathology with a single mechanism. 
a number of proteins in the proximal tubule may be affected, but ultimately we can think that what is affected is sodium bicarbonate co-transport in the basolateral border. Though it can be very simplistic thinking, considering the pathology of Fanconi syndrome as a reduced sodium bicarbonate co-transport in the proximal tubule can help us understand the features better. Now, Fanconi syndrome can be a familial condition, but that per se is rare. But there are any number of drugs which can produce a syndrome similar to that genetic disorder. And there are autoimmune disorders like Jogren syndrome, etc., which can also induce proximal renal tubular acidosis. So it's a multifactorial entity. However, in all of these, it may not be wrong to think that the transport process ultimately affected is the sodium bicarbonate co-transport in the basolateral border of the proximal tubular cell. This transporter along with the sodium potassium pump is important for maintaining sodium levels within the cell low so that the other sodium dependent co-transporters can function normally where the sodium gradient will help pull in the other substance. Because the sodium bicarbonate co-transporter is affected, all these sodium gradient dependent transport processes will also be affected and therefore in addition to all the other features of PRTA that we saw with acetazolamide therapy or hyperparathyroidism, an important feature of this type of PRTA is aminoaciduria and glycosuria where because these transporters are also affected glucose and amino acids appear in urine. So there is not only a bicarbonaturia there is aminoaciduria and glycosuria as well. Remember that these three substances are the ones which are almost fully absorbed in the proximal tubule and do not appear in urine. Whereas in the type of PRTA which is referred to as Fanconi syndrome, all these three substances will appear in urine. We will now move on to a discussion on distal renal tubular acidosis. The three mechanisms crucial for bicarbonate generation in the distal tubule are the proton pump, the urinary buffer phosphate and sodium reabsorption through the epithelial sodium channel which will leave the lumen electronegative. That electronegativity helps pull down more protons. So does the urinary buffer phosphate. It helps pull out more protons while not allowing the urine pH to drop too low. If it drops too low, the proton pumps may fail. These three mechanisms are important for bicarbonate generation in the distal tubule and a disturbance in either proton pumping ability or sodium reabsorption via the epithelial sodium channel can result in metabolic acidosis. Inhibition of the proton pumps per se leads to type 1 distal RTA and inhibition of sodium reabsorption via the epithelial sodium channel leads to type 4 distal RTA. Let us take type 1 distal RTA. What causes can lead to inhibition of the proton pump here? There are any number of phytochemicals which can induce this picture. Therapeutic drugs which are used for other purposes can inhibit the proton pump in the distal tubule. A good example of a phytochemical inhibiting the proton pump in the distal tubule is a suicidal poison that is used in southern parts of India. Claystanthus colonus is the scientific name. People consume a boiled decoction of this plant to commit suicide. There is 30% mortality and some component of the boiled extract inhibits the proton pumps in the distal tubule. Features of distal RTA 
are very similar, distal RTA type 1 are very similar to proximal RTA. Potassium is low. And why should potassium levels be low in distal RTA? We have not considered the reason in proximal RTA yet, but it is easy to appreciate why potassium levels should be low in distal type 1 RTA. Remember, this luminal electronegativity favors not only proton extrusion, but also potassium extrusion. When the proton pump is inhibited, the luminal electronegativity will pull out more potassium than usual. Therefore, there is potassium loss in urine leading to reduced potassium in blood. Urine pH will be more than 5.5, in fact, frankly alkaline, and that is because not enough protons are moving out into urine. Urine is not acidified adequately. That's what we just saw. Let's look at type 4 distal renal tubular acidosis. That comes up due to inhibition of sodium absorption through epithelial sodium channels. It is only sodium absorption through this that will leave the lumen electronegative. So what may these conditions be? Amyloride is a diuretic which inhibits the epithelial sodium channel. Let us say it blocks transport of sodium through the ENAC. And that will reduce luminal electronegativity, reduce proton extrusion and therefore reduce bicarbonate generation. Another important condition is hypoaldosteronism. Aldosterone enhances ENAC activity by incorporating more epithelial sodium channels in the membrane of the distal tubular cell. And in hypoaldosteronism, there is reduced ENAC activity and therefore reduced luminal electronegativity. Drugs which are aldosterone antagonists used as diuretics again will act similarly like hypoaldosteronism. So in these conditions, you can have what is called type 4 distal renal tubular acidosis. And the features of this condition, everything else is similar to the other two RTAs. However, potassium in this condition is high, just like in all other cases of metabolic acidosis. And why is that? The luminal electronegativity is important not only for proton extrusion, but also for potassium extrusion. And if that electronegativity is less, not only is proton extrusion affected, which is why you have less bicarbonate and therefore the metabolic acidosis, potassium extrusion is also affected. Potassium builds up in blood and that is why the hyperkalemia. When luminal electronegativity is low in type 4 distal RTA, both potassium and proton extrusion are affected, leading to metabolic acidosis coexisting with hyperkalemia, as is the case in every other type of acidosis. This is a summary of the causes of type 4 distal RTA. Let us look at differential features of these acidosis. From the lab reports, what can we understand? In all types of metabolic acidosis, serum bicarbonate is low. As a compensatory mechanism, PCO2 is lower than normal. Serum pH is, however, lower in spite of the compensation. And that's what gives us the picture of metabolic acidosis. In these two conditions of high gap acidosis, the really metabolic conditions, that is diabetic ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis, etc., and in renal failure, the anion gap is high. It's best not to comment on chloride levels here because we've seen that it can be low, normal, or even high sometimes. Whereas in all these other types of acidosis, the renal causes, GIT causes, and chloride loading, anion gap is normal and there is hyperchloremia. This is what we refer to as normal gap or hyperchloremic acidosis. And this, these two are high gap acidosis. If we look at the urine pH and serum potassium, they are different 
in these two conditions alone DRTA type 1 and proximal RTA which is type 2. Urine can be alkaline, relatively alkaline. Normal urine pH is less than 5 and in these two conditions alone urine pH can be higher than normal. It can be frankly alkaline in type 1 DRTA and in these, these two conditions there is hypokalemia whereas in all other types of metabolic acidosis urine is as acidic as normal because even normal condition urine is maximally acidic and in all these types of acidosis other types of acidosis urine is as acidic is as acidic as normal and serum potassium is higher. Now these two states resemble each other, how will you differentiate between these two? In these conditions of course, if it is diabetic ketoacidosis, sugars will be high and there will be ketones in blood. In renal failure, serum creatinine will be higher. These three conditions look similar, of course you could use the history to see which the probable case may be and in these two conditions the profile is very similar and a common test that is mentioned as being able to differentiate between type 1 and type 2 RTAs is the ammonium chloride loading test. You can look it up. This is a good reference for learning more about proximal renal tubular acidosis which is not as rare a condition as it was thought to be a few decades ago. Proximal renal tubular acidosis can actually cause more severe acidosis because remember proximal tubule has the job of forming nearly 4500 milli equivalents of bicarbonate every day that is the amount filtered every day and all of it has to be reabsorbed whereas the distal tubule only has to form 50 to 100 milli equivalents of bicarbonate every day. That is the amount that is consumed by fixed acids every day. With this, we complete the discussion on metabolic acidosis. The next session will be on metabolic alkalosis. Thank you.